Introducing Punchbowl News. From Anna Palmer, Jake Sherman, and John Bresnahan. News about the people who matter, for the people who matter. Join the community at punchbowl.news. Anna Palmer, CEO and one of the founders of Punchbowl News, joined by Jake Sherman, another founder. Uh, we are excited for this conversation this morning with Commerce Secretary Gina Raimondo, where we're going to talk about the future of innovation, you seek a chips, among many other topics. A big thank you to IBM for partnering with us on this event to make it happen. After our conversation with Secretary Raimondo, we're going to be joined by Dario Gill, Senior Vice President and Director of Research at IBM for a fireside chat. Just a quick reminder for all of those of you who are here in person, as well as joining us on the live stream, Some you can find us on all social media at Punchable News. So if you want to mm-hmm. chat about the conversation, only, tweet about it. Only say nice things. This is, this <laughs> <our request. laughs> that, that's Jake's request. <laughs> uh, we encourage you to share about this conversation today. Uh, and I also just want to thank all of the students from Georgetown's IOP for joining us this morning. We are excited that you all are here. And with that, we're going to welcome Secretary Raimondo onto the stage for this conversation. Thank you so much. Good morning. Good morning. Ah. Happy anniversary. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you. You're a one year big. old. One year old. Big. Well, as we always do, we start these conversations with a few news items of the day, and Washington never disappoints us, Jake. Uh, with well, it, it frequently does disappoint us, but we're not. <laughs> not gonna, with news. We're not gonna, something happening. We're not going to get into that. Let's talk about um, what's happening on the Russia-Ukraine border. Um, uh, Obviously, the defense part is not part of your portfolio, but a lot of talk about sanctions, which the administration has kind of wide-ranging powers to enact. Um, talk about that balancing act, right? I mean, this could could impact U.S. companies that have investments in Russia. I mean, talk about the impact for U.S. companies. Yeah, so good morning. I mean, first of all, I would say the president is engaged true, and his team truly nonstop in diplomacy. Uh, even now, you know, every minute, the it's obviously true that were Russia to invade, there would be disruption to the global economy, you know, not just the U.S. economy, the global economy. So we're doing everything we can to avoid that eventuality. Having said that, um, you know, the president's also been clear that we'll be ready to go at a moment's notice if Putin does invade. It's hard to know exactly how disruptive it would be to our economy. Uh, Obviously, you know, you worry about fuel price increases. And so we're already starting to think about what can we do to surge capacity, uh, working with our allies, working with uh, companies uh, to make sure that we are ready to increase supply if necessary. Uh, In terms of um, using any of our economic tools, I mean, the president's been very clear with me Secretary Yellen, uh, if this happens, we want a severe, swift, immediate economic retaliation. And the way to make that effective and also uh, not hurt our economy is to work with our allies. So we're spending a huge amount of time, myself included, uh, work at reaching out to our allies all around the world. Can you talk about another, the risk of a cyber attack uh, in terms of what that might mean for American business? If Russia attacks Ukraine, what kind of a ripple effect might that have? Are there recommendations? Are you in talks with any of the U.S. companies about what that risk might look like? Yes. So right now, uh, you know, listen, we're monitoring this every minute of every day. Uh, And there aren't, as I sit here, you know, credible threats, though that could change, right, in five minutes. So in America, most of our um, infrastructure assets are run by the private sector, private companies. So what we are doing is constant communication with private companies, uh, asking them to alert us to any, you know, anything they see, any evidence of a potential attack, get us that information right away. We're, of course, hardening our own systems at every agency. But it's, it's really, um, it's just this constant communication with the biggest private sector companies, with the private sector companies that run America's infrastructure, to make sure that we have this seamless information flow uh, so that we're protected, but also we can react immediately if something happens. 
So uh, we'll get to chips in a minute, which is your and my favorite topic. But let's oh, talk. Oh, I'm glad I have someone else. Uh, you, you, whose favorite <laughs> topic it is. Listen, we 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 love legislating. What could I say? Um, we've you've been. We'll talk about Build Back Better, which you were also involved with. That um, Joe Manchin has uh, buried under the dirt a bunch of times now. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, let's talk about that for one quick second. I mean, how? What is the future for that major plank of the Biden agenda? Yeah. You know, you're joking and you say he's buried it many times. It's also been resurrected many times. Not so, as many, but yeah, I guess so. Not as many. <laughs> but the truth is, you, you know, it could be, it could change tomorrow. It could change today. Here's how I think about it. Um, I think about it less as, you know, the Build Back Better moniker and just like, well, what's the president's agenda? What do we have to get done here? Reducing prescription drug costs for the American people, you know, bringing about uh, pre-K and affordable child care so we can be competitive with the other developed countries and, by the way, get women back to work, um, climate. So I think it's fair to say that the president's initial proposal is not going to be enacted as was proposed. Correct. But um, agreed. Will <laughs> will though you never know. Um, no, no, we do know that one. Will, yeah, no, right, exactly. <laughs> it, that's the one thing I'll say that will not happen. <laughs> but you know, will his agenda be enacted? You know, the planks that I just said. I think it will be. Uh, precisely in what form? Precisely on what day? I don't know. That's the point of legislating. Mm -hmm. But like. The president is committed to bring this sort of relief to Americans. And by the way, most well, Democrats in Congress are, too. You know, so it's just the frustrating process of legislating. By the way, I went through this as governor. Um, one of the biggest things I accomplished was a 10-year infrastructure plan. First time ever Rhode Island did this. It involved imposing truck tolls. Highly controversial. Mm -hmm. I did a press conference with the Speaker of the House and the Senate President the day I un unrolled it. They were for it. It took me two years to get it passed. <laughs> they were for it until the next day they were against it. So it's going to happen. It's not going to look the way the President initially proposed it, but we're not going to give up until his agenda in those component parts in some form or another becomes the law. All right. Let's shift focus to the focus of today's conversation, the future of American innovation and the role of technology policy in shaping U.S. leadership in scientific and research. Um, the Senate passed, as we all know, USICA. The House earlier this month passed the Competes Act. Informal negotiations to combine those two bills started taking place this week. Share from like a 30,000-foot perspective how important this legislation is to address this global semiconductor shortage. Necessary, important. We're not going to address it without it. I don't know how else to say it. Um, you also could take bets on how many more times the name's going to change before it becomes law. <laughs> well, we're on, we're on, just for everyone's, everyone's recognition, it was Endless Frontiers. Exactly. You seek a, right. and now competes. No, no and, I, America, made in America. Made in America, made in America which, whatever. Made, anyway, Democrat yeah, it sounds good. Made in America for all this. And chips. <laughs> anyway, not, I should. Chips is good. Good TV it's show. It's great. <laughs> good. It's great. It's all good. But no, in all seriousness, uh, a lot of young people here, you guys need to care a lot about this. Right now, you can't look around. Everything has chips in it. That clock, your phone, that computer, your car, everything. The most sophisticated military equipment. Art I don't know what you all do. Artificial intelligence, any kind of computing, cloud computing, your ability to work from home on Zoom. Chips, 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 chips. Silicon Valley is called Silicon Valley because we started the chips industry in the United States of America. And over the past 30 years, we went from making 40% of the world's chips to making 12% of the world's chips and 0% of the world's most sophisticated chips. They're almost all made in Taiwan. You talk about export controls? Think about a world where there's Taiwan export controlled chips to America. We are in a dangerous situation. And there's one solution, make chips in America. And it's not going to happen unless that CHIPS Act is passed. How important is it? It's not going to happen without it. These chips, chips, demand for chips is at an all-time high. And it's going to continue to be at an all-time high. Intel, Samsung, TSMC, Micron, they're going, to build, they're going to build more facilities. That's a fact. Whether or not they build them in America 
to make our economic and national security secure depends entirely on the policies, depends entirely on chips. So, yeah, I mean, you, I, we were teasing each other about how important this is. It, it is that important, and so we have to get it done. So let's dig in a little bit to the, the differences here between the America Competes Act, well, whatever, the yeah. House bill and the Senate, the Senate bill. I mean, give us three issues, and I'm not going to let you off the hook here. I want to drill you down on three issues that need to be worked out. Like, what are the big, you know these things pretty well. I mean, yeah, yeah. what are the three okay. things that need to be no, bridged? I'm, no, I don't want to be fresh, but it all has to be worked out. So <laughs> I'll say this. What, so what are the three biggest right. differences? Okay, fair enough, fair enough. So let me say it like this. There's agreement in principle on the entire thing. The shape of it. Exactly. Right. So I'll give you a perfect number one, a perfect example. Supply chain. In the House version and in the Senate version, uh, there's a supply chain office to be set up in the Department of Commerce in both versions. But they're different. You know, the Senate version has no money. <laughs> The House version has authorization for $45 billion. The House version is more robust. They're going to have to work through that, right? Whose version? But fundamentally, there's, in both bills, setting up a supply chain office at the Department of Commerce, huge bipartisan support. Second thing is um, big investments in research and development. The House does it one way. The Senate does it another way. The president's view is we can be flexible, but America has, is lagging behind in the amount of research and development investment that we do as a federal government. It's been cut in half in the past 20 years as a percent of GDP. We have to invest. Whether it's through an NSF directorate or Department of Energy, they got to work that out. But fundamentally, we have to increase that. Um, uh, research hubs, you know, right. regional research hubs. You know, again, there's broad agreement. We need to uh, have innovation outside of just Silicon Valley, Boston, Denver, Colorado. Exactly how that is done, they have to figure it out. So and you could go through 2,500 pages. So yeah, no, more I, than go three, three. Is what you're saying. There's a lot <laughs> yeah. more than three. Of course. But there's no, um, there's the, 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 the bones of the bill are bipartisan. The goal of the bill, all 2,500 pages, is bipartisan and there's agreement. they got to go through it piece by piece and, you know, we'll figure it out where there's common ground. Let's talk about that, though. I mean, I know the administration's been pushing for as speedy of a passage as possible. Yeah. I think the timeline, right, very aggressive to say before the March 1st State of the Union. Yeah. A lot of folks don't think that's going to happen. There's been Let's a rephrase. It's, it ain't going to happen. Okay. Well, then there's a lot of people who've said maybe, you know, it'll be Memorial Day. What do you think is a realistic timeline? So let me tell you my view. Um, when I had been asked, will it be done by the State of the Union? My answer was there's no reason it can't be. <laughs> and I still feel that way. Uh, Memorial Day is too long. Now, this is the Commerce Secretary talking, okay? Uh it shouldn't take that long. The chips portion of the bill is practically identical. The only actual appropriation of money in this thing, the $52 billion, which is what we need yesterday, is nearly identical in, these, in the House and the Senate version. A lot of this other stuff, the vast majority, two-thirds of the bill in the House's version were bipartisan. So come on. Get to work. Well, the House is out until I know. February 28th, so, <laughs> my, so that gives them all of my, March 1st to get it done before the State fine. of the Union. I didn't say it was going to happen. <laughs> yeah, I hear you. I just said this is a national emergency in my view, and there's no reason it couldn't happen. My own personal, I spend some time on this every day. I'm not waiting for the conference. We are pre having pre-conference meetings right now, today, tomorrow, the next With day. the Hill. Yes, with the Hill. I've talked to... Uh, all, you know, Chairman Pallone, Pelosi, Schumer, Wicker, Cantwell, Frank Lucas. Today I'm talking to Cornyn, Todd Young. So let's dig in on that for a second. I, I'm going to, we got some emails from Republicans who are involved, who are involved in various iterations of this. 
who say a few things, who say Pelosi has put in things and put put things in the bill that they know that they can't vote for Republicans. And then here's a more interest, I guess, and also a question I'll ask. Well, let, let's address that first. I mean, do you do you see that the House version is maybe not designed? That's their complaint. It's not been designed for Republicans to vote for it. So get to the conference table yeah, and that's figure a fair, it out. Fair enough answer. This is Congress. This is the way it works. I mean, you can't pretend to be surprised. No, I'm not surprised. <laughs> Trust me. This isn't the first time no, in the I've... history of Congress that the bill comes out. In a partisan way. Yep. In a partisan way where there's some things in there Republicans can't vote for. Let, that's a headline. Let me ask you, <laughs> let me ask you this, though. One of the criticisms that we heard, or this isn't even really a criticism, it's more of a question. So let's say this passes, gets signed into law. You probably have a runway of a couple of years until some of these, the manufacturing is re-onshored, is brought back to the U.S. Would you concede that? And also, if you concede that, how what can be done about the supply yeah. chain issues in the shorter term? Yeah, so awesome question. I'm Thank you. Sure, I'm, <laughs> I'm not sure I would concede that. Okay. For a couple of reasons. Um, we need to be very creative in thinking about partnerships that could increase supply. It is definitely true, as you say, it takes a couple of years to build a new large fab, for sure. But I don't know. Are there other partnerships that we could incentivize that would increase supply in the shorter term? There may be. Fair and enough. we want to work on that. The other thing is, um, I am quite sure that there's a lot of private capital by these companies on the sidelines right now that will be immediately unlocked once this thing is passed. They're waiting to see, is it going to be passed? So for example, Intel announced a few weeks ago a $20 billion facility in Ohio. Yep. They said, and I've talked to the CEO, that 20 could go to 100. But is that, is that 100 gonna be in America? They're waiting to see what's going to go on with the CHIPS Act. So I do think the, when Congress gets rid of the uncertainty and this thing actually passes, you're going to see private capital flow. Interesting. Okay. Can I say one more thing? Yeah, please. Um, I, in the days following the House passage and the Republicans uh, being upset, I talked to a lot of House Republicans. And I would say... To a person that I spoke with, they said, we're ready to work in earnest on the substance at a conference to see if we can get this done. And I'm taking them at their word. And my view is I'm going to call them every day and let's stay at the table. We asked, we're quickly running out of time, but I want to ask, you mentioned kind of how the, the Commerce Department's kind of mission would be expanding through this uh, can you yeah. talk about that, your role, why that is so important, um, kind of what impact that might have? Yeah. So the Commerce Department is, is right now at the center of so much of supply chain, supply chain resiliency, technology. You know, we are in charge of the um, $50 billion broadband implementation. You can't have any of this until every American has affordable broadband. That's a, that's a massive responsibility for the Commerce Department. Uh, the CHIPS money will come to the Commerce Department. The Supply Chain Resiliency Office, like mapping and monitoring the supply chain so we never again wind up in this mess, comes to the Commerce Department. Um, privacy regulations, export control. Like commerce is at the red hot center of technology, economic development, and supply chains, which is where so much of the action is. So we are, yeah, we're busy. <laughs> we're busy. So wait, before we let you go, we have two minutes left. We got a bunch of great questions from these Georgetown students uh, in the audience today, and thank you again for coming. Uh, here's one that they had for you. With China outpacing the U.S. in data collection and AI development, yeah. how can the U.S. maintain its position, or do you see this turning into a new technological arms race and the need for big tech to cooperate with the U.S. government? What would this require, and is, is it feasible? We have to outcompete China. We can't let them get ahead of us in these emerging technologies, including AI. And by the way, that's this bill we were teasing about what the name is called makes investments in basic research 
that will allow us to maintain our edge. Uh, it, it, chips do too. All of AI run on the most sophisticated chips. I would say the competition with China is most intense around technology. Yep. You know, it's it's military, but 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 less so. Not to diminish that, it's this. It's technology. So not only do we have to make investments in America, in our in our workforce and in our R and D, um, we also have to protect, work with our allies to deny China access to our most cutting-edge technology. So it's offense and defense, but I would say this is like at the very top of my agenda and of, of our agenda. Wonderful. Secretary, thank you so much for your time today. We really appreciate it. Bye. Great. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right. Bye. Thank you. All right, I'd like to welcome Dario Gill up to the stage for our fireside chat. Dario, thank you so you? much. My pleasure. Great. Thank you, sir. We got a lot of uh, interesting commentary from the secretary, so we'll have a lot to follow up on here. Um, she talked about, I, I want to start off because she talked about the idea of these hubs and what maybe kind of, you know, the two to three year runway, what could happen. You all, with uh, a bunch of partners this morning, announced an idea, a vision for what that could look like. Talk to us a little bit about what IBM's role is in that. Sure. Well, first, uh, following uh, the Secretary comments on CHIPS Act, uh, I think it's important to understand that there are two dual tracks that are present in the legislation. One is around manufacturing, and the Secretary commented on the fact that the United States used to make 37% of the chips on shore, and now that number is 12 percent, and uh, and none of the advanced uh, chips uh, that the industry produces. So to address that, you got to build fabs in the U.S. But the other component is the innovation component, right. is the R&D component. You have to have the next generation transistor technology, packaging technology, etc., to be able to be at the forefront. So what we announced today is the contributions of 36 different partners, uh, representing from startups to large companies to universities uh, to public sector entities, uh, coming together and presenting a vision of what that R&D agenda ought to be for the National Semiconductor Technology Center that is contemplated in the CHIPS Act uh, legislation. So talk a little bit about what that would look like. I mean, what are the roles of universities? What are the, give us, put some, a little bit more meat on the bone on that. It's an interesting concept. That's right. So, so one element is workforce development. Uh, today, the semiconductor industry in the United States uh, employs about a quarter million people direct. Uh, indirect is well over a million uh, people who contribute to it. And also, to be able to create and design uh, the next generation of chips requires very specialized STEM skills. So a whole effort around how we're going to educate and motivate Americans to participate uh, in, STEM, in STEM and contribute to CHIPS is hugely important. The second one is a very set of specific recommendations on the actual research that needs to be conducted. Uh, memory technology, how we're going to store the bits for the future, uh, how we're going to process the zeros and ones of the future with next generation transistors. How are we going to package this technology together? So it's that element of now getting concrete. There's the aspirational goals mm -hmm. of the investments. But now we're going to get very close to the execution phase. And we feel it's very important to be ready. Because one common characteristic that everybody uh, is discussing is the urgency of it. You heard it from the secretary. There's a bipartisan dimension of this, of we need solutions kind of tomorrow. And the best way to do that is to bring a coalition of willing partners that have the capacity to execute that agenda on day one. Talk about that, because you know, the secretary clearly is pushing very hard to get this uh, you know, married bill across the finish line as soon as possible. State of the Union, as, as, as Jake jokingly said, not going to happen. Maybe Memorial Day is another time frame. From your perspective, like, how critical is it that this gets done sooner rather than later? I, I think this is existentially important. Uh, semiconductors are the underpinning of all aspects of modern life. Yeah. Uh, on an economy, on national security, on education, entertainment, every dimension of it. And we've ended up in a bad spot. Uh, and that problem wasn't created overnight, and it's not going to get solved overnight. But without the passage of the CHIPS Act, and with all of us, without all of us coming together to solve this problem, 
um, you know, it would be catastrophic consequences. So this has to be passed, and we have to execute. And I want to remind also that this is going to be a decade-long effort. Yeah. Like when you are at 0% <laughs> manufacturing capacity uh, on advanced nodes, even to get the goal that us and our allies get to 50% capacity by 2030, that's a very ambitious goal that we need a lot to be done between now and then. That's what I was going to kind of follow up on. I mean, give us a sense of, you said it's ambitious to get to 50% in the next, I guess that would be eight years. How long is the runway on something like this? I mean, what is it, what could we expect in a year if this passes, let's assume it does, in a year or in two years or in three years? What does that look like? I think um, if we go back to those two tracks, the National Semiconductor Technology Center, the research track yep. and the manufacturing track, if we use existing infrastructure, state-of-the-art infrastructure, examples of it is you know, the ecosystem, for example, in New York, uh, that is a public-private partnership, publicly owned, $15 billion of investment of, uh, and a very advanced 300-millimeter uh, research and development line, you can stand up the first hubs of the ecosystem for research within six months to a year. Oh, wow, okay. Now, the manufacturing dimension of it, it is inevitable if you're going to build new fabs, that takes two to three years. Right. So, so I think we can be very proactive and very fast in standing up the research capacity by tapping into our university networks, startups, infrastructure that exists, and get going on that within that window. Can I ask, I, I, we heard from the secretary that maybe there was capital that's kind of on the sidelines because companies don't know what's going to happen, right? Is yes. Congress going to act? Is Congress not going to act? Do you buy into that? Do you agree with what she's oh, kind of saying? Definitely. I mean, you, you already see some of the um, you know, beneficial effects of the legislation in its anticipation mode in changing the conversation about it is time to revive the manufacturing capacity of the United States and of our allies. It is time to invest much more aggressively in R&D. And, and I think you're starting to see some early moves in the private sector of anticipating that occurring with the expectation that if it passes, it will get amplified. So I definitely think that the tide is changing. And I think we were getting too comfortable eroding the R&D capacity of the nation. I mean, we mentioned like the fact that you know, the peak in terms of global, I mean, investments, of federal investment in R&D in the United States peaked in the 1960s with the Apollo program. And that was like 1.6, 1.7% of GDP invested in R&D from federal government. I think we're like at 0.7 or 0.8 right now. So it is time to invest again in the science capacity of the nation to address some of these issues like semiconductors, but beyond. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you talked about universities. I want to follow up on this. I mean, how much is this is, of, of this is investing in, some, in STEM education? I mean, you're really talking about building a workforce from almost nothing when we don't not almost nothing, but it's, it, I would imagine it's a huge effort to bring America up to speed on, on that kind of education. Is that right? Well, uh, what I would say is that, you know, the university ecosystem in the United States is a crown jewel of the nation, right? For sure. And, and, and really in the advanced research universities, they're second to none. The issue is we have to balance the dependency that we have had on attracting foreign talent to fulfill uh, those jobs, which if you look at, for example, in graduate programs, you see numbers like 60 to 70 percent of, you know, master's and PhD students in STEM come uh, from abroad. Now, the consequence of that is that as the economic development in other nations continues to improve, you have less of a draw right. for right. them to come to the United States. So the way to substitute it is to lessen that number, invest much more in fomenting Americans to go through that pipeline. So we do have the universities that are capable of educating in these areas with extraordinary capacity, but we are going to need to change the mix right. and the commitment to educate Americans to go through this journey. Right. When you look at chips and kind of the money that's behind it, you know, we're talking a lot about the marrying of these two bills. What is the kind of, you know, is there a top issue that you feel like must be included that needs, that is very important from your perspective? I think that in the, um, if you look again on the R&D piece of it, which is maybe 10 to $12 billion of the $52 billion, it contemplates both uh, what we refer to as NSTC, the National Semiconductor Technology Center, and another piece that is the packaging, right? So the way advanced electronics get created is you have many individual components of chips, and then you've got to integrate them together into your cell phone, laptop, and so on. This 
two worlds of packaging and the semiconductor piece are not separate worlds. They need to have a shared common agenda. Today in the legislation is contemplated a little bit as like there's NSTC and there's a packaging center. Um, we need to recognize that those two things are very synergistic and they need to be run and integrated together. So I hope that that gets done also in that final process of the reconciliation. And so if let's just take a, a look down the road at five or ten years from now. Um, if we, if this is passed, if CHIPS is passed, which, again, my base case is that it is passed, and it has been for a long time, so <laughs> hopefully I'm right. Um, uh, give us a sense of just how big of a boon you think this will be for American technology companies and for the U.S. economy. Oh, as I used the word before of existential, incredibly important. And I like the, that you're asking the question of the next 10 years. Right. Because the legislation right now, you know, it contemplate, contemplates the next five years. But really, this needs to be a long-term sustained commitment. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. And, uh, and this is like phase one. But then five years from now, we've got to continue to sustain the investments. It's actually very damaging from an R&D perspective when you do like yep. a seesaw. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Right? Because you sort of mobilize capacity. Just think about it if you're a student. You say, okay, this field is incredibly promising. It is growing base. You go, you study. It takes you four years. So if you do a PhD, it's another five years. And then you come out, and then the investment plummets. Right. And now what happens? <laughs> So, so we need, like, stability on the commitment that we have around that. But then if you combine it with all the hard tech elements of semiconductors, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, all of those examples, I think we're witnessing the most exciting time in the world of computing in the last 60 years. And really is, is if we commit to get it done and we fund it appropriately and we mobilize the STEM capacity of the nation, we're going to have a tremendously successful decade you know, and beyond for American technology. But it is a moment of resolve and will to reverse something that has been eroding for a long time. Uh, but this is a moment to get it done. And uh, I really think it can be like a historic moment for science and technology R&D to get that done and also in federal agencies like NSF to amplify their mission and broader the impact that they can have in the American economy. Yep. All right, we're going to give you the last word. You've been focused on this issue for a really long time. We're kind of at the 10-yard line, if we're using football metaphors after the Super Bowl. Oh, no, not a football uh, um, metaphor. You know, <laughs> what, what's your message to Congress? I mean, you talk about definitely on this bill, but, you know, it sounds like the minute this gets passed, you're already on to the next kind of investment of this. Yeah, I, I think it's very important. My message to Congress is urgency on uh, getting this done and, and also that that just to sustain the commitment on something that is broadly bipartisan. Look, I was very involved also early on when, when the passage of the National Quantum Initiative a few years back. Uh -huh. It passed, you know, I think it had on the Senate like 98 votes. Like, just think about what pieces of legislation nowadays have that level of bipartisan None. commitment. <laughs> None. So I, I actually think the science <clears throat> agenda of the nation is one that has broad bipartisan support. And we need to all stay committed to this long-term trend to reverse it systematically, year after year, right? And also public sector and private sector are coming together to continue to invest in R&D. And I think if we do that, we're going to have a very bright future to get that done. So that's my message. <laughs> I appreciate it. All right, Dario, thank you so much for your time this morning. We really appreciate it. I want to say a big thank you to Commerce Secretary Raimondo and her team for making this conversation happen, as well as IBM for partnering with us, uh, as well as all of you for joining us in person and on the live stream to the Georgetown Student Center here. If you want to stick around afterwards, Jake and I are going to take some questions from you after the event wraps. But with that, thank you all so much. Have a great day. Stay safe. We'll talk to you soon.